Well, good evening, Asia. Good afternoon, Europe, and good morning, North America. Uh, I feel very fortunate that INET has been able to work with and build on the insights of 21 people from around the world who are extraordinary and who started really uh, at the time of the China Development Forum in 2015 to understand that many things, many challenges that were approaching us, uh, particularly in that context, US-China relations would require new thinking and different type of thinking, particularly as it pertains to the relationship between governance and the market economy. In this context, uh, the Nobel laureates, Michael Spence and Joseph Stiglitz agreed to be the co-chairs. Mike had headed up the Growth Commission that was embedded at the World Bank and Joe Stiglitz had headed up a UN commission, which I was fortunate to serve on. And both of them understood the, the process and the, how they say, responsibility for impact that that would entail. We have focused in the meeting since the inception in, late, in mid 2015 on many different things that I will call the disruptors of the status quo in the world. Climate, global warming issues, technology, the future of work and the future of information systems, the, uh, how would I say, more mature but substantial role of global financial markets and financialization, the induced pressures that society must deal with in the realm of migration, and all of this flows into the questions of governance in a global economy where the scope of the market is much broader than that of the nation state. We have many of our commissioners uh, have been involved throughout this process, but today we have a subset here to speak. Uh, first off, Joe Stiglitz, who is the chairman of the subcommittee on globalization and governance. He will fr frame things, what this interim report is focused on. And then after that, uh, Jayadi Ghosh, who is a professor now at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, but for a long time at the uh, uh, Nehru University in New Delhi. And uh, Jayadi will fo focus on intellectual property rights, vaccination, both production and equitable dissemination. Following that, Rohit and Medora, who is our partner with INET through, through the Center for International Governance Innovation, as Sharmini ma mentioned, Jim Balsili was one of our co-founders going right back to our first conference in 2010. And Rohinton will talk about a number of issues, but particularly on the question of SDR allocation. Then we'll come back to Joel Stiglitz, who will focus on the question of debt, sovereign debt restructuring, in light of a pandemic where the debtor countries are not responsible for causing this calamitous experience that we're all uh, undergoing at present. And then finally, Michael Spence, Nobel laureate and the head of our uh, subcommittee on technology and the future of work will summarize his thinking in light of what the others have presented. And then we'll turn it on to uh, questions. As Sharmini mentioned to you all, it would be nice if you would put your questions in the chat box and then I will moderate and can call on you, but I'd like to draw on that list as the basis for understanding who would like to ask a question. Let me turn it now over to, in terms of just process, like I mentioned, Joe, overview, Jayadi vaccines, Rohitin SDRs, Joe on the debt restructuring, Mike for a summary, then the Q&A, and I will try to have you all back uh, heading on to the next adventure of the day by nine o'clock this morning. <laughs>
Uh, I'd also like to emphasize that in the realm of debt, George Soros has been working himself very actively on the question of perpetual debt, most recently in Los Ecos in relation to a, uh, uh, an article about French national issuance of perpetual debt. And I know that the Global Commission will pick up, though it's not a feature in this short-term paper, I know it will be uh, an element of the challenge that we will address in forthcoming uh, communications and, and reports of the committee. At any rate, Joe Stiglitz, please uh, carry on from here. Okay, well, thank you all for coming. Um, you know, the, the background for this is, is obvious. We're, we've been in the midst of an unprecedented uh, pandemic and it's had unprecedented uh, economic uh, consequences. Um, and uh, uh, we're gonna be talking uh, today both about the health side, uh, but also more importantly, uh, equally importantly, the economic uh, side. Um, for those in the developed world, uh, we've been immersed in this moment where uh, discussion of when we will get our vaccines, uh, uh, when will the population be vaccinated, uh, but uh, it's a totally different experience, as Jody will point out, in the developing world. Uh, uh, many of them are not scheduled to get the vaccines uh, for years to come, unless we change uh, what is going on. Um, and a central idea here is, particularly with the threat risk of mutations, the world is not going to be safe from the pandemic itself until the pandemic is controlled everywhere in the world. So in that sense, it's even in our own self-interest that there be a rapid dissemination uh, of the vaccines and the other uh, medicines, uh, the masks, the tests that help control uh, the pandemic. So that's one part of, of our report. Uh, as Rob pointed out, uh, we are engaged in a long-term assessment of the global economic transformation, but the pandemic interrupted our long-term work and we thought it was important to get a report out now uh, uh, because it's really imperative that we respond effectively to the pandemic. But the economic aftermath of the pandemic is also an issue being discussed in uh, everywhere. In the United States, we're celebrating the fact that we at last have had a very strong rescue package of some $1.9 trillion uh, amount uh, in com combination of what was passed in the spring and December of almost 24% uh, or more of GDP. If you look at the numbers the, of the kinds of support that the poor countries have been able to uh, provide to recover their economies, it's minuscule. Uh, among the least developed countries, it turns out to be about $11 per capita. Um, and in the middle income countries, uh, somewhat greater, but still a fraction, a fraction of that of the amounts in the advanced countries. And again, we won't have a strong global recovery unless we have a recovery everywhere in the world. So it's a matter of self-interest and it's a matter of compassion. The assessment of the risk by the Biden administration is one that we agree with. The risk of doing too little uh, is far greater than that of doing too much. And we have instruments for responding if there is too much. So we're very supportive of what the Biden administration has done of this large injection of funds. But it won't be enough for a global recovery. And it certainly won't be enough to save the developing countries and emerging markets from uh, a nor large numbers of more people going into poverty uh, and uh, even more outcomes that will wipe out years and years of success in development. 
And that's why this report focuses on the developing countries and emerging markets. And so the key issues that we face are, how can we make sure that they have an effective response to the pandemic, to the disease, and that's what Jai is going to talk about. How we can give more fiscal space to the developing countries and emerging markets so they can have, if not the kind of response the United States has, at least a response that have, has the hope of having them recover growth quickly. And uh, an essential part of that is the issuance of SDRs that Rohinton will talk about. And another important part of, uh, of dealing, providing fiscal space is dealing with the debt crises that will be particularly strong uh, possible in a number of countries. And I'll come back and talk about that. Uh, so with those preliminary remarks, uh, Jadi, want to pick up? Thank you very much, Joe, and it's a pleasure to be here. I think Joe has already highlighted that, you know, the distribution of vaccines has been one of the most striking examples of inequality that the pandemic has brought out. And what we've seen in the last few months is a very unseemly vaccine grab by rich governments, which have uh, basically booked about 85% of global supply for 2021 very early on in the effort to make sure that they have enough for their own populations, to the point where some countries have booked several multiples of their population's worth of vaccines, uh, between four to 10 times the number that they would actually need. And this means the developing countries have been not just excluded, but they're unlikely to get vaccines, sometimes in some cases until 2023, 24. And there are 130 countries today in which not even one vaccine has been administered. Now, this actually needn't have happened. There was a facility, COVAX, which was created by WHO and two other organizations specifically to avoid this, to enable equitable distribution of vaccines with every country contributing some amount and then distributing according to population over time. Unfortunately, COVAX is underfunded. And even now, it expected about 6.8 billion this year. There's only 4 billion it has received. It needs probably double that amount, about 13, 14 billion, to um, enable a significant increase in vaccination in the whole world. Uh, it's very easy for developed countries, especially with these large stimuli that Joe mentioned, to significantly increase their donations to COVAX. But more importantly, the reason that developed countries are rushing to grab shares is because there is this fear of scarcity. And this is actually an artificially created scarcity. When the technologies exist and when there is such a pressing global need, it really doesn't make sense to restrict production simply because of intellectual property, which is why there was, in fact, a proposal brought by some developing countries, India, South Africa led it, but it's now supported by two thirds of the WTO members to suspend intellectual property rights during the period of the pandemic. And this refers, of course, to the patent rights on vaccines, but it also covers the entire range of treatments and medical equipment that is required, like PPEs and so on, do and testing during this period. Because it is possible, we have the technologies, we have the production capacities in developed and developing world. And it is therefore possible to make sure that everybody has enough to actually administer to the whole world and to ensure that every the global population is protected from this disease, possibly within a year. This would require basically the active support of developed countries who have been blocking this proposal so far eight times. The next meeting, in fact, is today uh, in, the WH in the WTO. And it is hoped that you know, the developed countries would actually agree to this because it's in their own interest, as Joe pointed out. It would make vaccines cheaper for everyone. It would enable more production globally, which would actually allow everyone, even in the rich countries, to get it much, much faster. And it would be cheaper for developed countries' governments to buy these vaccines. So it would save money for citizens, for taxpayers. It would provide vaccines much more equitably, much more quickly to everyone in the world. This uh, patent exemption will probably be required for several years because until the pandemic is fully controlled, we can't really hope uh, to move on and get the kinds of economic recovery that uh, Joe was talking about. Transfer of technology is key 
thus far the uh, companies that have developed this bear in mind that they have developed this very rapidly not because of the promise of the patent but because they were massively subsidized by rich country governments the us government alone has spent up to 16 billion dollars in support for vaccine development significant amounts in the european union as well so these are companies that have developed these vaccines rapidly with public money and with various kinds of regulatory approval that have been developed very rapidly. There is no reason to then ask them to, to prevent, to uh, not to enable them to actually spread this technology much more widely. So the voluntary transfer of technology is definitely desirable and ideal. But if it's not voluntary, this is money, this is, these are technologies developed with public money, they should be available to the world's public. I'll stop here then. Go ahead and please. Thank you. Um, so what we do in this report is point to short-term options that exist uh, to deal with COVID, but in each case, they also point to longer term structural gaps in global governance that have to be addressed. And we will be covering those as well. And the fiscal responses to COVID is a good example um, of that dilemma. Um, as Joe pointed out, in the face of a historically unprecedented health, economic and social crisis, uh, many rich countries uh, literally threw the economic policy rule, rule book out the window. And they did that because they could they had the wherewithal to do so. As a result, as we point out in the report, um, IMF figures suggest that on average, uh, advanced countries have spent about 22% of their GDP uh, fighting COVID. In emerging markets, it is about 6% of GDP. And in developing countries, it is 2.4%. So that's the imbalance that Joe was referring to that we highlight here. Now, on a per capita basis, uh, the figures are even more stark. Uh, advanced countries have spent about 9,800 US dollars uh, per person uh, during COVID. Uh, developing countries as a whole, about $17 per person. Um, there, there's two ways to get around this issue. The most obvious of remedy is a large issuance of uh, special drawing rights, STRs. Uh, what this would do is uh, inject quickly and effectively purchasing power to countries as a whole uh, that belong to the IMF. Um, this was proposed early in the crisis and at the time opposed by a couple of countries, particularly the US. Uh, the new US Treasury position that Janet Yellen has outlined is more positive towards this, and this is something that should be welcomed, although we don't know the details. Uh, and the reason this should be welcomed is that an SDR issuance at this stage would not be inflationary. We live in a largely uh, uh, zero inflation, perhaps even deflationary environment. Um, not every country that receives SDRs is obligated to use them. In fact, one of the uh, mechanisms uh, that, that we could use here is to have advanced countries allocate their SDR allocation to more needy countries, and there's a facility to do so. And so this points to, to the longer term question of creating a more systematized uh, environment in which SDRs might be routinely or at least issued in a rules based way, rather than in an ad hoc way during crisis dependent on different countries agreeing or not. The second way in which uh, macro policy cons constraints can be avoided is to actually look at what strictures countries face when it comes to spending. And here we point out in the report that while advanced countries could literally spend their way through the crisis, uh, many developing countries are under IMF and other lender strictures that prevents them from do doing so. Uh, we cite in the report that between March and September of last year, 76 of 91 loans in 81 countries, uh, developing countries, actually required deep cuts in public spending at exactly the time that you wanted social spending, public spending, social safety nets to be strengthened. And so this points to the longer term question 
of designing policies globally that are uh, contracyclical, not procyclical, and ultimately to the largest of family of issues around voice representation and the operations of the IMF, which we bundle together into the question of IMF reform, which has again come, come to sort of stark contrast given the very varied fiscal responses that we have seen during this crisis. So I will stop there and turn it back to Joe. Joe? So the, the other way of, or other aspect of giving uh, fiscal space, the ability of poor countries to spend more is dealing with their debts. Uh, there are a number of countries that had been induced or uh, had un in one reason or another undertaken excessive debts before the pandemic, but there are other countries that seem to have not excessive debt, but when they were struck by the uh, economic fallout of the pandemic, it turned out that uh, this calamity put them over the brink, as it were, that they uh, their debts are beyond their ability to pay given the depth of the global economic downturn and the downturns in some of their countries. Um, in some of the countries, uh, the declines in GDP have been of the order of magnitude, not just of the 8% that Europe has experienced, uh, but of 10, 12% uh, or more. And obviously, uh, economic downturn of that uh, magnitude makes it very difficult for the countries to uh, service their debt, let alone meet the special needs of the pandemic. Well, uh, the unfortunate situation is that while there's been a lot of discussion for about organizing uh, a systematic way by which countries who are over indebted can restructure their debt, uh, there was a, uh, a proposal put to the UN General Assembly of creating uh, a mechanism for sovereign debt restructuring uh, in 2014, overwhelmingly adopted uh, by the General Assembly. And in 2015, overwhelming agreement on a set of principles, a very limited number of creditor countries, but very important countries have refused, opposed the, those initiatives. And so here we are in 2021, without an adequate mechanism of dealing with uh, these uh, excesses of debt and restraint. In the beginning, there was a lot of a, 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 a uh, pressure to create a standstill, to do something to say, okay, you don't have to service your debt. But meanwhile, the uh, what is owed uh, uh, stays. Uh, there may be, in many cases, an increase uh, interest payments accumulate. And as the pandemic has gone from what was thought originally to be a few week interruption into a year, and for the developing countries and emerging markets, maybe much longer than that, it is clear that it, what is needed is not just a temporary halt in payments, a stay, but a restructuring of debt for many countries. But unfortunately, the experience that we saw it, when we had the call for the stay is not hopeful. The private sector did not want to participate. Some governments did not want to participate. And unless there's a comprehensive agreement about debt, it is very hard to get uh, anything to happen because each debtor believes that if it has a stay, or if it engages in restructuring, it wants to help the developing country, not help other creditors. And uh, if one country doesn't uh, collect and the other say, we demand a collection, you're not helping the poor country, you're helping the other creditors. So that's why it's imperative, it has to be comprehensive. And so in this report, we describe measures that could be undertaken that would uh, help facilitate that kind of move towards a comprehensive debt restructuring. In the past, we found out too often there's been too little too late. 
And the result of that is that one debt restructuring is followed by another with an interim in which the developing countries and emerging markets suffers enormously. So we don't want this too little too late. We know about that. We want it to be comprehensive. As a matter of law, for instance, we recognize uh, implicitly or explicitly, there are principles called, for, called force majeure or necessity in any contract that there are circumstances that you cannot pay and then the contract is in effect abrogated. If there were ever a time in which force majeure or necessity, these legal principles were relevant, this is it. But there are also measures that could be taken by the creditor countries that would uh, uh, motivate private creditors, for instance, to participate. And there is a discussion of a bill, for instance, in, in New York State, one of the jurisdictions in which a lot of the uh, uh, debt is written that would uh, move things along this way. So our report calls attention to the importance of uh, doing something about the debt problems and doing something quickly, because otherwise those countries that are afflicted uh, are going to be uh, facing uh, real poverty and, and an inability to uh, recover uh, their economies. Thank you, Joe. Mike Spence, uh, your thoughts. Maybe I should unmute myself first. So what my colleagues have, uh, I think, covered the territory extremely well. So let me simply kind of reflect on it in slightly <clears throat> altered terms, but, but, but certainly nothing, uh, you know, running orthogonal to what they've said. Um, I kind of operate with the following framework uh, in thinking about these things. And I don't think I'm alone in this. <clears throat> it has three parts. One of them, our colleague Mohammed Alarian said very well, and, it, and he's quoted in the report, it's, it's the proposition that no one is uh, safe until everyone's safe. And I think, you know, if we cared only about uh, health, setting aside the economic issues for a time, there'd be a, a very, very powerful argument for getting on with removing obstacles of the type that Jadi talked about to getting the vaccine done. The second proposition is, I believe this, maybe it's controversial, but I believe it's not possible to have a full or even an adequate economic recovery while the virus is out of control. And I can't find any exceptions globally. When the Asians didn't need uh, vaccines to get the virus under control, and so their economies recovered more quickly, but basically the proposition still stands. If the virus is out of control, there's a whole lot of sectors that get shut down, jobs lost, balance sheets damaged, and so on. <clears throat> and so I don't think you can delink the health side and the economic side at all. Uh, and the third is the pandemic. We all know the pandemic economy has been a big negative shock at varying magnitudes, as I think Joe mentioned, across the world. But, it, but it's been an even larger uh, negative uh, outcome with respect to distribution. And that's true domestically in most economies, and it's certainly true globally. Um, and so what I think my colleagues are trying to do in this report is, is focus on the distributional side of this thing on a global basis and try to understand how we can do this better. And, and, and I think they have communicated effectively a sense of urgency. You know, the longer this thing runs, the more damage that's permanent. Um, that comes into the economy. You know, people, we lose businesses. People lose their livelihood. Kids can't get back to school. You know, we're facing a calamity uh, in education in the developing world if, the, if education simply fails for two or three years. Uh, we don't talk an enormous amount about this, but, but it, I think it's what motivates me and indeed the whole commission to focus on this. So I think you've heard the message clearly on our current trajectory, the lower income countries especially um, are going to experience uh, not only a huge extended um, you know, health catastrophe, but uh, negligible economic recovery. Um, 
in, 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 as a result of the, their inability to access the vaccine things. And I think Jad is exactly right. And the report is right that we need, whether it's compulsory or voluntary, I mean, I think, you know, we're gonna have to find that out as we go along, but I mean, we absolutely have to, there is production capacity in the world. It's a question of getting the authorization, the, the licensing, so everybody can produce this it, massive quantities of these vaccines and get them distributed. Distribution is another question, and there'll be hurdles um, in many countries face that they face because they won't have the infrastructure to get it done. Um, but at least they'll have a, a running a running chance. And finally, I think you know that the, the simple truth is that the United States just passed a 1.9 trillion dollar fiscal program. Uh, focused on kind of getting us through to the end of this pandemic economy. And as all of my colleagues have said, there's a very large number of countries that simply don't have anything even remotely resembling the capacity to try to buffer the shock of the pandemic economy on the health side and on the economic side, um, and they need help. Uh, and, and I think we've, we've, we've covered where they need help, you know, at least in, with a fairly precise target here. One, they're, they need to, in one form or another to have their fiscal capacity expanded. They can't do that on their own. If they just do, try to do it on their own, their capital account will go unstable and you'll get worse results, hence the SDR allocations and so on. And finally, you know, they're going to be in trouble in terms of debt. And as Joe rightly said, we need a comprehensive mechanism you know, uh, that includes private sector creditors that uh, that allow us to, to, you know, bring ethics into the situation and, uh, and effectively uh, restructure those debts so that they can survive and, and, and come out of it effectively. So I think that's, that's kind of what we wanna draw attention to. I'll just simply say this morning before we started, I read Janet Yellen's letter to the G20 I think it's entirely consistent uh, with uh, with this report, and I'm and I'm I'm very pleased that the United States seems to be moving in the same direction and providing uh, some impetus to discuss these things at a level where where there might actually be action. So that's enough for me, Rob. Back to you. Thank you, Mike. Thank you uh, to all of our presenters. Uh, first of all, uh, this report that we've been referring to is now available on the INET website. The title is The Pandemic and the Economic Crisis, A Global Agenda for Urgent Action. And uh, it's called The Interim Report on the Global Response to the Pandemic. Uh, I believe we'll be posting it in the uh, quote section for all of you who are online here. I believe Charmaine just put it into the comments section. Uh, I'd, I'd encourage those of you who have questions that you'd like to ask of the panelists to post them. Uh, but I, I can start with uh, Peter Goodman from the New York Times. Uh, you have a, a question about the COVAX problem and the nature of it. Uh, Jay Eddy, uh, I think Peter would like you to address his question. Can we unmute Peter and, uh, and carry on, please? Sure. Yeah. yeah. Thanks very much, Rob. Uh, Jayati, thanks for your time. I just want to ask, you know, people speak about COVAX typically as if it's this, you know, well-intentioned, philanthropic undertaking, and it's just underfunded. Uh, and I, I wonder if, if it's not far more severe than that, uh, going to the structure of, of COVAX, which looks to at least this observer, something like stakeholder capitalism. You know, it's discretionary. Everyone's got the best of intentions, but we have no idea what the pricing is. We have no idea what sorts of commitments there are for volume, but we can see that the countries that actually need the vaccine aren't getting it. Uh, and meanwhile, companies like Pfizer are telling us publicly that they expect to make $15 billion this year selling vaccine. Is it COVAX properly seen as part of that problem and not the solution in that they are uh, maintaining the lack of transparency uh, and uh, they're ultimately not delivering the goods? Uh, that's a very interesting point. I think the fundamental design flaw in COVAX is that it allowed for these bilateral side deals of governments with companies. 
I think that was the basic design flaw. Once you've got that, everything else kind of follows. You're right that there's lack of transparency in COVAX in terms of the pricing, but that, you know, COVAX is such a small player today in the global vaccine market. The real lack of transparency is between governments and these companies. I mean, AstraZeneca alone is ch charging higher prices in South Africa, I think $5.25 per dose compared to the European Union, where it's charging $3.50 per year, dose. So I think the real problem is that COVAX allowed for the bilateral side deal. Ideally, the governments that signed up for it should have said, we will actually orient all our vaccine uh, distribution through COVAX. And that would have ensured transparency because there would have been active interest of the citizenry of the developed world in this. It would have ensured a more equitable distribution and it would have ensured adequate funding. There would have been much more resources put into COVAX. But again, another, I think, essential point in this is that the, the supply is constrained today really for artificial reasons. So in a way, the other, if you like, more deep design flaw of COVAX is that they did not anticipate this problem of limited supply. And therefore the, you know, the monopolistic behavior of those who had actually managed to get the regulatory approval. And they should have anticipated this in terms of ensuring some technology transfer agreements well before. Yeah, let me add one thing. The, the essential problem is, is the intellectual property regime. And that's why the discussions of the suspension related to pe the, the uh, COVID-19, uh, whole gamut of things from masks to vaccines uh, should have been adopted urgently earlier. Um, you know, it was interesting, the United States, uh, Biden was very proud that he found that the Merck had excess vaccine capacity uh, and uh, got uh, uh, Merck to, uh, uh, produce uh, some of the vaccines that have been developed by others. But globally, there's a lot of capacity for expansion of vaccine production. It's intellectual property is the artificial barrier that Giotti uh, emphasized. And uh, this is an emergency where the consequences of delay are very large. And part of having a patent is that you have to make disclosure that enables others to replicate what you've done. And if you don't do that, you lose your patent. So uh, it is really imperative that we, we actually enforce that aspect of, of the intellectual property regime and that we suspend intellectual property in concern towards the, the uh, uh, issue of uh, pandemic related uh, vaccines and, and other medicines. Um, there's a real urgency here as, as our report emphasizes. I have a question from uh, Luwe at uh, Kaijin Media, probably best addressed to Roe Hinton. Luwe, could we uh, have you unmuted so you, you can address your question, please? Yeah, can you he uh, hear me right? Yes. Yeah. Um, so I'm wondering for the SDR issuance, what could be the main area to spend on? I know climate change seems to be perhaps the only thing that most economy nowadays, especially US and China can see each other in the eye. Uh, and Europe is in agreement with this uh, a lot. I know Joe did a lot on climate change and uh, Mr. Soros, I think back in 2009 also called for issuing SDR to, uh, to help poor countries tackling climate change. I'm wondering, um, is it a good idea to sort of issue SDR and use part of that to fund joint effort on tackling climate change? Is there a case for this? So thank you for the question. Let me, let me go first. Um, the first point to note about an SDR allocation is that it is actually issued to countries. And so at the end of the day, how SDRs are spent is a national decision, not a multilateral decision. The only multilateral element so far is the proportion, is the size of the allocation and the proportion in which the, the SDRs are allocated to countries. So my sense is that if there were, and the proposal has been made for $500 billion in SDRs, um, uh, 
it is for countries to decide where it would go. Now, you raise a very interesting point, which is if SDRs is, is a sort of common currency, can it be used to produce global public goods, as it were? And there are some schemes um, floating which would create global facilities to create these kinds of global public goods to which SDRs would be issued. There's a long standing, going back three or four decades, uh, discussion uh, on uh, precisely that. In fact, goes back to the uh, discussions at Bretton Woods. But as the system is currently constituted, it is really for national countries to decide uh, what they spend their allocations on. But I do think using SDRs to create a global pool that's managed to, to fund underfunded global public goods is something that we should look at more carefully. Yeah. Let me add just one more thing to that, which is, as I say, it is the reallocation of the SDRs in which there can be uh, a global uh, commitment to decide uh, that they should be used for one purpose or another. But some of the research that we've done uh, uh, supports the view that there are uh, ways of spending the money which are both good for the recovery and simultaneously address issues of climate change and the other crises like our, our inequality crisis. So that one could put that, you might, I don't want to say conditionality, but, but, but that emphasis on climate uh, together with uh, a concern about inequality and one can find good ways of spending the money that are timely and high multipliers, that is, they get a lot of bang for the buck. And that would uh, all work towards the urgency that we have at the moment, but also towards the other major crises that we face. Is there anything uh, Ms. Soros want to add on this? I think uh, we perhaps come back to uh, to George. I don't see him on right now. Yeah. Uh, we have a question, uh, Andrea Shalal. Could we unmute Andrea, please? Hmm. Hey, thanks for taking my question and thanks for this important um, session. A couple of quick questions. Um, so the TRIPS uh, provision in the World Trade Organization uh, already permits, you know, and includes a clause on voluntary licensing and it has the possibility of doing compulsory licensing. That has been used in the past, not in COVID times, but it, it has been used in the past. So people that I've spoken to say, why don't countries just invoke this instead of, um, you know, invoke the compulsory clause instead of pushing for these, you know, potentially uh, precedent setting, you know, waiver, the waiver that, that South Africa and India are proposing. And then, um, I also wanted to ask about something else. You mentioned that you know early on there was this proposal to have an SDR allocation, um, and the you know the thinking all along was that it had to be relatively moderate in scope, so that it wouldn't have to be approved by the U.S. Congress. Um, that might be less of a concern now that Congress is you know in democratic control. Um, but there does seem to be sort of consensus around something in the order of $500 billion of SDRs, not $500 billion SDR. Um, can you reflect on the size of that versus say the $2 trillion um, SDR allocation that um, is, is being proposed by some folks in the US Congress? But also I'm curious, India was one of the countries that voted against um, the SDR allocation. Now, India, of course, you know, would have benefited from that as well. Do you know any of the background of why that happened and, and what the thinking was, or were they just falling in line with the US in order to work on their own priorities in the bilateral relationship? Thanks. Jody. 
Charlie, you, you're not mute. You're you have to be unmuted. Oh, I'm sorry. Am I, yes, I, I, I'm sorry. Yes, I'm out of the line. Yes, thank you. Yes, Andrea, you're absolutely right. The compulsory licensing provision does exist. And, and Chile, for example, and I think also possibly Israel have already tried to issue, I mean, they have, uh, the, their legislatures have actually announced that they will go in for compulsory licensing. Unfortunately, the critical issue here is the transfer of technology. There are lots of complications in issuing compulsory licensing, but that delay can, can be sorted out. It is the fact that there is no incentive for pharma companies. If Chile is such a small market, you know, or is, that they don't need to actually bother with ensuring their presence in that market right now. And so there is no incentive for pharma companies to transfer technology and to go for a compulsory license in these countries. And uh, so therefore, you know, it's not enough to allow and enable individual countries to issue these licenses because the pharma companies are not going to transfer the technology. And so the only way in which to get rid of that disincentive is to actually suspend the intellectual property altogether. That certainly has to be one of the ways in which one could perhaps persuade the big companies to engage with the possibility of voluntary transfer of technology. But in the absence of the voluntary transfer, it's so clear that this is monopolistic behavior that is harming the entire globe, and that it is obvious that we really have to issue, uh, you know, suspend the intellectual property rights altogether, which gets rid of that incentive to avoid transferring the technology. Just if I could quickly add on the why did India oppose, you know, this was something that stunned most of the Indian population when the Indian government opposed the issue of SDRs. And uh, it is true that India was hoping to be one of the recipients of the US Fed uh, exchange rate swap. Ultimately, the, it was not. We did not get the benefit of the US Fed exchange rate swap. India had at that point, and unfortunately, even over the pandemic period, has built its reserves by being incredibly fiscally constrained and in practicing austerity in the midst of the pandemic. But also, I think there was a fear that even if India benefited a little bit, Pakistan would benefit much more. I regret to say that this was actually something that was discussed uh, in the Indian elite circles. Can I mention two points? Uh, one, uh, on the, on the uh, 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 compulsory licenses, the concern is speed, uh, that the processes that, to comply with the WTO uh, compulsory provisions for compulsory licenses. The worry was that it would be too too slow. And in the past, when compulsory licenses have been proposed, there's been a lot of pushback from the advanced countries, uh, uh, threats of one kind or another. So uh, Jadi is absolutely right. Uh, it, I, I think it would facilitate, uh, given the the urgency at this moment a suspension uh, of the uh, intellectual property rights uh, is really important. And we're talking about not just vaccines, we're talking about even uh, masks, uh, we're talking about uh, a whole range of intellectual property that's relevant for the pandemic. On the SDR issue, um, I think a lot of, uh, uh, of the advocates of SDR, I'm among them, think it should be uh, close to the maximum that can be issued without going back to Congress. The next 500 billion SDRs, which is roughly equivalent to 650 billion US dollars. Uh, there's a recognition that it's probably not enough, but uh, again, to uh, reflect the refrain of urgency, the whole process of going to Congress and the parliaments of countries all over the world that are members of the IMF to get the $2 trillion that have been proposed uh, in the US Congress um, would le lead to a delay. And so the issue right now is, can we get a quick issuance? And uh, there has to be a 90 day notice to the US Congress uh, and uh, that's delay enough. Uh, so I think uh, the, the focus, it should be the largest possible. And I think it's around 650 billion US dollars, 500 billion uh, SDRs. And what the India really SDR quickly. issue really illustrates is precisely to get away from that kind of uh, bilateral politicking and having a more systematized arrangement in which SDRs are issued on some kind of rules-based system, 
to avoid what uh, Andrea, you pointed out and what Jayati described, I thought was uh, the, the unfortunate reality. Can I just ask one quick follow-up question? The other issue that David Malpass has spoken about in regard to um, kind of a more efficient distribution of vaccinations is uh, has to do with liability problems and that, you know, some countries have been unwilling to sort of indemnify the manufacturers. Um, and, you know, this is a, a kind of an issue that would leave pharma companies at risk at, if they're, you know, selling into countries. The whole contracting process has obviously been pretty complicated. And the mal I think the World Bank is working through those issues individually, but do you have any thoughts on the liability problem and what could be done to um, address that? I mean, do we just need more financial institutions to step up and basically take that, take on the risk in some form? My understanding is that most governments have actually taken on the risk. There are very, very few governments that have not provided an underwriting of this liability. It's very rare, it's a very, it's a small minority of governments that has avoided this. Yeah, interestingly, although liability issues have been a problem in some vaccines in the past, this is not the barrier today. So it's, it's a red herring. Um, it's, it reflects a, an agenda uh, of some conservatives that say the problem, you name it, the problem is liability uh, and, and our tort system uh, in the United States. Um, it has effects, uh, but at least in this case, it is not the major constraint. Okay. Uh, we have a question from uh, Patricia Sagba. Can we help her with unmute, please? Yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, I have a question for Professor Stieglitz regarding vaccine passports. Many have argued that they are necessary to help consumers feel comfortable again to re-engage in those customer facing service sectors of the economy that have been hardest hit by COVID. But also those opposed also raise deep concerns that they could deepen inequalities um, especially between nations. So where do you stand on vaccine passports, especially if, if we don't get um, a waiver um, for IP protections for COVID vaccines? Well, that's a hard and, and good question. Um, you know, uh, there are, to put it in economic term, externalities. Uh, that's the heart of the analysis of, of, of uh, a public health issue, a pandemic. Uh, and so uh, it is reasonable that uh, you impose regulations that uh, reduce the extent of the externalities and that uh, 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 help control the disease. That's what, in a sense, vaccine passports do. They, they say, uh, you no longer are a danger, and that gives you certain privileges that you wouldn't have if you are a danger. Uh, so uh, having vaccine passports uh, makes uh, sense from that perspective. But unless we are able to make sure that there is access to vaccines for everybody, it introduces uh, an important inequity. And that's why I just come out on saying the first imperative has to be to make sure that everybody uh, who wants to be vaccine, vaccinated gets the vaccine. And uh, as Jody emphasized, uh, it's not the capacity, the limit is not the capacity of the world to produce. Uh, we will have a, some temporary inequities over the next year, but if we were to address the problems of intellectual property and production, then I think the magnitudes of those inequities would be uh, certainly limited. And the societal benefits of getting the pandemic under control, uh, I think in this particular instances, instincts really dominate. Okay, uh, we have a question that was posted from Mr. Zeng from NetEase Finance. He's having difficulty with audio, so I'll present his question. Uh, 
He's asks in developing countries, if they were to enact a large package like 1.9 trillion, would they suffer from inflation risk? So are they then not able to spend that amount of money like the developed countries? Uh, Mike Spence, Joe Stiglitz, Jody, any 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 thoughts on his perspective? Um, well, um, I guess we'll all comment briefly. If a, first of all, they couldn't issue that much debt. I mean, the, 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 nobody buy it. And second, if they did manage to do it, the rest of the they'd have capital flight, uh, and you know, exchange rate volatility and a balance of payments crisis. So. <laughs> By the time you got to the end of that story, I don't think the main problem is going to be inflation. Joe and Jody, you take it. Joe, would you like to? Yeah, I, I think that's exactly right. I mean, they basically uh, um, don't have access to funds. You know, uh, if you ask, if you if you look at what is going on in the United States right now, uh, to a large extent. Uh, uh, the U.S. government is borrowing from the Fed. And so the Fed is financing it. But at the same time, the, uh, there is no inflationary pressure, uh, not because the uh, monetary, the base money is, is increasing, but there's such deflationary pressure from the fact that the economy is operating so much below capacity. So the the uh, so we're able to finance this amount of of uh, uh, rescue uh, without inflationary uh, pressures. Now, a developing country, uh, uh, a small developing country, um, is imports many of the critical goods. And that means that if it were to issue a corresponding amount of, you might say, money, and that money were spent, it would cause a foreign exchange crisis. And uh, uh, it would be uh, difficult for it to uh, ensure that that money was going only for domestic uh, purposes. So, um, and, and part of the problem is it's, Exports are also declining because of the global economic downturn. So uh, you can't uh, solve a global problem. A small country can't solve a global problem on its own. Yes, I, I just want to completely agree with those. You know, the inflation problem is, is absolutely non-existent in most developing countries today. Uh, insofar as there's inflation, it's cost push driven by oil prices in particular countries. But really, there is so much deflationary pressure that the real reason that developing countries are not able to spend is the balance of payments concern, particularly the fear of capital flight, which is there even in emerging markets that currently do not have other balance of payments problems or external debt problems. And it's that fear of capital flight, which is also strongly driven by the credit rating agencies that tend to look specifically at public spending and fiscal deficits in developing countries, which is becoming the major constraint on developing countries doing any kind of fiscal expansion. Okay, well, I think we're coming close to the end of our time here. There is a certain silent uh, influence that I want to raise. One of our global commissioners, Danny Kwa, is online with us. Uh, he's chosen not to ask a question today. And I would like to refer you to his podcast that he made with me last spring because his knowledge about the onset of a pandemic based on history of understanding past pandemics was very illuminating. It was one of the most highlighted podcasts that I did during the year 2020. He's also behind the scenes, a very strong contributor to our global commission. And I wanted to thank him for joining us today and for all of the insights that he has nourished us with as members of the commission. Uh, as I mentioned, both in the comments area and on the website at INET, the interim report uh, is available. I don't know if anybody has final comments, but I myself would say it is imperative that we turn this catastrophe into a time of lesson or teaching. And these 21 people have banded together to try to find the silver lining 
and the learning that the pandemic has challenged us to discover to, how would I say, further the well being of humankind in response in the coming years. Joe, Rohinton, Shayati, Mike, any last thoughts? Okay, well, thank you all for joining us. And uh, we look forward to the next time we can chat. Please contact Sharmini Perez if you would like to do interviews with any of these commissioners or, or discuss issues further and uh, stay tuned. There are more reports to come from the Commission on Global Economic Transformation throughout the course of this year. Bye-bye for now.